I want to be mindful. I want to start it off right. Happy Mother's Day again to all the mothers, whether here on heaven or uh, whether in heaven or on earth, those of them here, those that have been a mother without uh, being a physically born mother to others, we want to acknowledge you, you know, those aunties, awards, all of those. So we want to start by saying happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. You wear the title well. Uh, with that being said, we go ahead on into our lesson. Um, we welcome you to another Abundant Life Cogent Virtual Sunday School where we invite you to come in to learn, go out to live. We're concluding our spring quarter, which is from the month of March through May with the prophets faithful to God's covenant. We're on lesson 10 of 13 and we have begun our May segment of Courageous Prophets of Change. Courageous Prophets of Change. Um, Last week, our title was Micaiah, Speaking Truth to the Power. We discussed how God used the prophet Micaiah to speak truth, even though King Ahab rejected the message. We cover 1 Kings uh, chapter 22, uh, some, some of the verses uh, within there. And today, our subject matter is Isaiah offering hope for the future. Um, and that's coming from Isaiah 29, 13 through 24, 13 through 24 here. Let me get this. All right. And so we, we coming out of uh, the book of Isaiah <clears throat> and the book of Isaiah presents itself as the writing of one man, Isaiah, the son of Amos. Isaiah's message is relatively simple. Um, first, he accused God's people of sin, rebelling <laughs> against the one who made them and redeemed them. Second, he instructed these sinners to reform their ways and act obediently. Third, he announced God's judgment on the people because of their sin. And finally, God revealed his future restoration of the people, or at least of the faithful remnant that survived the judgment. The interesting thing about Isaiah is that one should never be able to read or study the book without having new insights into the nature of God and our relationship with him. Isaiah is quoted in the New Testament more than any other Old Testament book, as we know that he's predicting uh, Jesus that's that's coming for. So that's a little background about the book of Isaiah. And, you know, I always start off with the in focus of how we can relate to what's going on in the story today. And this is this is uh, in reference to Isaiah offering hope for the future. And this this is um, Pamela who's in a bind and she's a repeated offender. I mean, we all may have faced those Pamela's in our life, but we we want to we want to make sure that um, we serve a God that restores and redeems our relationship. So the story goes as this: Pamela was in a bind and needed help with an unexpected car repair. So she called in a favor from a friend, Asia, who was always willing to lend a helping hand. What Pamela didn't know was Asia was fed up with being her emergency fund and had already determined the next time she made one of her 911 calls for financial help, she was not going to help. The reason, Pamela was not a good steward over her finances and was known for making poor choices. Asia loved her friend, but for her well-being and the sake of their friendship, she had to set the boundary. Also, Pamela was slow to return what she borrowed, and when she did, there were always an excuse for not repaying the full amount. So Pamela called Asia and asked for $500 in loan and said, I promise I will pay you back next time when I get paid. I will set it up to send electronically, Asia thought. My father in heaven is rich, but I'm not your bank. But instead she responded, girl, I don't have the full amount, but I can give you half. I'm so sorry that's all I can do right now. Asia said, Pamela said, I understand. I've been to you well too many times. I need to make changes. So a repeated offender, we, we've all had someone that we've helped and they you know, continue to call on us for the help users as a resources and 
say it'd be if you uh continue to give uh, give out water from the well eventually the well is gonna run dry and um so asia got tired of that she said i ain't want this well to get dry she need to get her her, her financial um financially decisions in choice and and excuse me she need to get her financial decisions in order you know she's making a lot of bad decisions uh she loved her friend but she she stopped it because it was for the benefit of uh pamela's own good so that she can work on those behavior because she's been doing this so many times so the question that i have unto the floor if someone was a repeated offender would you continue to give your resources to help them? Actually, it would depend on the situation. Um, if it's not a dire situation, no, I wouldn't. Because they're just depending on me, not even trying to make a way for themselves they're just saying, knowing, oh, I can go to her and she'll give it to me. So if it's not a dire situation, I would not. Okay, so, so smart. Any, anyone else would like to like to share? Um, you know, I I agree with with Sister Lawrence, um, and I have been in that situation. And um, just like the lady in the uh, story, there, at one point, you know, I just in a in a nice kind of way. I just stopped because I, I saw the same kinds of behaviors as was in this story from that person. So I just stopped. That person never, ever asked again. And I didn't stop in a nasty way or anything like that, but I never had that person ask again. That means that either they had other resources or they learned how to handle them, their finances. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I'm, I'm, good morning, Go everyone. Yes. I'm going to agree with, um, what's been said thus far you know you don't want to see nobody in dire uh, in a uh, dire situation you don't want to see them like that so if that was the case you know i'm not going to see nobody out however um just repeatedly doing it over and over from the same situation at some point no we're going to have a conversation you know and say no nah, because i'm at, at this point i am enabling your situation so, and we can't, we can't do that, you know, and then we got to be good stewards over what God has blessed us to. That's being careful on who we saw and knowing the situation, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, that's biblical too. So. Yes. Yeah. I, any, anyone else um, before I chime in on my behalf? All right. I agree with, um, what everyone has has said, and uh, definitely my my um my sentiment is uh, mimic uh, more of co-pastor. You know, I don't, I always say I don't want to be a crutch unto you. You know, when you you depending on me, that, um, God is using me, but I don't want me to be your resource until you're not going to God. You know, God can place other people in your life for those those resources. So I don't want to handicap anyone. Um, this is which I always always um, inform them, so I, I try to help them make those better decisions. But yeah, I had to had to cut that off as, as well because I don't want them to see me as their their resource. You know, God God is your resource. He's used me as a vessel. You know, He's blessed me to to do that the times that it was. But I do it in love. Yes, definitely definitely do it in love because we serve a God that, as we would learn in this story. We know that the, um, the Israelites, they was repeated offenders over and over and over. Jerusalem repeated offenders over and over. It kept doing the same thing over and over. But God forgive. Um, think about in the New Testament when Peter asked Jesus, how many times you should forgive? He said 70 times seven. I'm like, oh, man. And I, you know, I, I think about it in the uh, lesson. And we serve a loving God who always inviting us back into a relationship, fellowship uh, with him. We get it right. But in flesh, I'm like, man, nah, nah, that, no, that person just a bum now. You're just a bum. You call it what it is. That's, that's, that's the fruit that you're producing. I'm not judging, but that's the fruit you're producing. I, I can't help. You know, it's easier to adapt that mindset in the flesh because we have, we have those emotions that we put ourselves into 
But when you look at things spiritually, how, how can we serve a God that's forgiving and is always looking to restore the relationship with us when we after we've done wrong and not seek to restore those relationship with others? Is that love? Because God is love. But moving right on on to the lesson. Hey, uh, Minister, uh, Minister Wright, can I also add along the same line? And, and when God does that, the scripture talk about whom he loves, he chases, he teaches us when he, when he put us through those, when he denies us things or have us go through things, he's teaching us so that we may grow. And, and that's how we help people when we don't be that crutch for them, help them to grow in those areas. Amen. Amen. He, he chastised those who he loved. I mean, we happen to grow. Sometimes people not accepted. Uh, receptive to the message of learning because they they own their emotions right now. It's like, you know, there's a saying that people don't often remember all the yes that you say, but they remember the no's. That one time you say no, oh, you the baddest person in the world. <laughs> you the most rude person, and they, they 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 count that. They keep records of it. But First uh, Corinthians says, "Love keeps no record of wrong." But moving right in, along, which I definitely agree with you, Missionary Bridge for. Uh, again, our, um, our lesson title is Isaiah Offering Hope for the Future. Our Bible basis is Isaiah 29, 13 through 24. Our Bible truth is Is <clears throat> Isaiah's oracles warn against disobedience and promise blessings for obedience. Our memory verse is, they also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. That's coming from Isaiah 29, verse 24, the King James Version. Um, our lesson aim, by the end of the lesson, we will value God's promise of mercy, which triumphs over God's judgment, proclaim that an essential characteristic of God's nature is forgiveness and rejoice in the manifestation of God's love in our own lives. Our background scriptures is coming from Isaiah 29. And we have 12 scriptures this morning. If I can get two volunteers, one reading from uh, verses 13 through 18, and another reading from verses 19 through 24. And if you're coming on, I did start by saying Happy Mother's Day. So the mothers that just coming on, Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> we'll make sure that I be in good standing with the mothers there. So if you can read the left left side of things, King James Version, again, two, two volunteer, one reading verses 13 through, 13 through 18, and another picking up from verses 19 through 24. Wherefore the Lord said, inasmuch as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips, do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men therefore behold I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people even a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Woe well unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed, as the potter's clay, for shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not, or, he, or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding. Is it not yet a very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. And in that day shall the deaf 
hear the words of the book and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the terrible one is brought to naught and the scorner is consumed and all that watch for iniquity are cut off that make a man an offender for a word and lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate and turn aside the just for a thing of naught. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not now be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale. But when he seeth his children, the work of mine hands in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel. They also that erred in spirit shall come, shall come to understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. Amen, amen. Well, we know the question. Which verses stood out or resonated with you upon reading the scriptures? For me, it's going to be verse 15 was what really uh, resonated with me. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord and their works are in the dark. And they say, who seeth us and who knoweth us? Um, because when I looked at that, the only thing I could think about is God sees everything. God knows our motives. He sees our heart. He, he knows exactly. We might think we're fooling or hiding things from him, but God sees everything. Listen to that verse four. Why we have the same scriptures <laughs> every Sunday? You know, that's de that's definitely the one for, for me as well. It's like you fools. <laughs> it re it reminded me of the Genesis when you know they say, "What are you doing?" You know they come out with the, the palm leaves. Who told you you were naked? Like they call themselves hiding. <laughs> how, how you hide from a omniscient and omnipresent God? And so here it is. <laughs> they consider how they thoughts. You know, David, David say he know my sit down, my thoughts, my my words far away. And here, here they are talking about they hide themselves from God. So yeah, that, that stood out <laughs> to me as well. Anyone else? Any key verses resonated or stood out with them? Stood out to you. 13. <laughs> 13, wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. That's, that's definitely a, a great one that uh, should resonate because the Lord is looking for those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. So that it, that's, to me, it was it's just putting you in a dangerous place. Yeah, yeah, man. To, to, to read those words and say that you that you you worship me, you, your your heart is far from me, far away from me, but have been removed their heart far from me. Your heart far from God. Woo! No, I got to clue that in a prayer, thy Lord. Keep my heart close to you. The number one commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your body, and your soul. So we want to make sure that we love them in the heart so that their heart was far away from them. You know, where a man lay his treasure, there his heart's lies. So their treasure was somewhere else. So, yeah, that can go on with that that verse right there, Sister Charlene. is a definitely good one. Anyone else before we go ahead and get the background and dissect our lesson? I, I know the Borkins have something to say. Deacon Borkin, you got to give me something, man. I ain't heard from you in a while. I know you got something. And then after a while. You remember, <laughs> I, get there, I get there in a minute. Okay. <laughs> Mother, Mother, get your own mothers. Yes. Deacon Borkin says, Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. All right. All right, so moving right along um, into the lesson. So the, our background 
um, within the stories lessons. Uh, we know that we last, again, just to catch up from last week, last week was in Lamentations and that was a uh, hundred or so years before this Isaiah's um, that was going up, just so that it's not confusing of the, the um, chronological patterns of the lesson. But this background lesson is for, for 60 years, Isaiah served as the prophet in Judah. He stood as the voice of God amid the people's disobedience and his message was to call them back to God. At the start of Isaiah's divine appointment, Judah experienced military and financial strength. As a result, the elite disregarded God's commands, especially in their treatment of the poor, widows, and orphans. And we talked about that in, um, excuse me, not Wednesday evening Bible blast, as well as their arrogance. Then the neighboring Assyria grew into grew in political and military power. Rather than turn to the God of their salvation or for refuge, Judah's government leaders looked to the surrounding nations for safety, which was an insult to God. Isaiah 29 opens with the prophet making a sorrowful declaration upon Jerusalem using Elias Ariel, which means Lion of God. Isaiah predicted how God would deal with Jerusalem disobedience. The holy city would be under siege and in mourning because of the coming distress at the hand of their enemies as punishment for their idolatry, idolatry and self-centeredness. But the message also shift focus at the enduring punishment. He would also handle those enemy who would rise against his chosen people. So there's again, Isaiah offering hope for the future. We serve a God of hope. And these, these um, lessons can be broke down into three different sections. Um, our verses 13 through 16, we would consider that far from center, as we said that their heart was far away from God. Um, verses 17 through 21 can be break down as return to center. And our uh, verses 22 through 24 is return to covenant. Excuse me there. Speaking a lot in the morning, get dry mouth here. So, so again, this, starting with the far from center, and that they said that Isaiah is one of the most quoted Old Testament and the New Testament. Here you see in Matthew, these people say, God, honor me with their words, but their heart is really far away from me. It is not, it is no use for them to worship me because they teach human rules as though they were my laws. That's the same scripture uh, verse that, you know, Sister Charlene said that resonated with her, which is verse 13 in Isaiah here. So it starts off, Isaiah 29, 13, this, this story right here starts off with an indictment of the people. An indictment is a formal charge of accusation. God is calling the people to the carpet for their actions. Remember, after an indictment, you have a trial in which you determine the truth of the matter. But here God's word is always true. So what he is saying going on is exactly what is going on. This is a chapter of woe. <clears throat> and woe, woe is an exclamation of grief, distress, lamentation. As we saw in the book of Lamentation, this is not lamentations of the people, but God's lamentation. Woe is a good thing. It's a chance for us to change direction. So in, in this um these lessons we're talking about worship. So before we, you know, we um, criticize worship, want to define what worship is. Worship is, uh, according to the uh, dictionary, an honor, the feeling of expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. Uh, but we know as believers with our personal relationship with God, worship is done based on our relationship with God. It's done from the heart. That's why he, God says in verse 13 that your heart is far away from me. You know, you, the people that they say they are mine, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. God don't want just lip service. He wants your heart. He wants you to do it from your heart. So we want to be mindful when we, when we worship and is it coming from the heart? You know, that is not just a, a ritual or a custom that someone is pumping prime, but you got it's, it should be based off your relationships because praising is is praising someone for what they do or what they have done 
but worshiping is worship for who you are. So you have to have that personal relationship to um to worship God. Um just so now that we we have that, you know, just breaking down these these key key verses here, 13 through 16. The people of Jerusalem professing to know God were formerly involved in the act of worship, but they did not worship God from their hearts. They were more concerned with man-made legalistics rules than with God's law, which promotes mercy, justice, and equity. Because of that, God caused the false prophets, rulers, and seers to fall into deep delusions for choosing to follow after darkness. As a result, Judah was unable to understand the word of the Lord and brought into a drunken stupor. That's going through verses uh, nine through 12. Isaiah called them out for their hypocrisy, lip service and religious performances. The Lord would go on to pronounce spiritual judgment against them through Isaiah saying that their worship of him was misguided. While Judah followed what had become man-made rituals they failed to reach his heart. Further in their conceit, Judah's leaders thought they could outsmart and hide from God and live without his wisdom. God pronounced woe on those who thought he did not see their actions. They attempted to hide their plans from God by doing things at night. They said, uh, what was done in the dark shall come to light. God is the light, you know. <laughs> so I don't know. Again, I, don't, I call them fools. I don't know what they, they thought they was doing hiding. We, you know, we can't hide stuff away from God. And many times we, it's Mother's Day. We go on to the mother. We try to hide things from our mother. And, you know, mother knew. I remember uh, growing up, I would sneak some food and try to hide it under my bed. And mom bust in the room. What you got? Like, <laughs> she, she knew what it was doing. Or I got in trouble in school and, and mom would ask me anything that you want to tell me. No, how was school? School was good, <laughs> you know. But did they find out? But as I was listening to one of the elders, and uh, he shared his story um, about how he got saved by the belt, and then the Bible. He <laughs> said that uh, he, um, his mom told him to go tell his dad what he did. He he was he got caught stealing in school, and so he told his dad. He said. The devil, the devil made me did it, Dad. <laughs> he said his dad told him, well, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to deliver you from the devil. You'd never be able to say that the devil led you to do this. And so he said, I'm going to beat the devil out you. <laughs> uh, but we can't hide anything from God. God is, a, is he's, he's omniscient and he's omnipresent. We cannot hide anything from God. He can't hide from our parents. Our parents is going, they, they know. They're they going to know. So, um, again, God, so the, they were not thinking clearly. Um, they attempted to hide their plans from God by doing things at night. But we serve a God that can hide things from man, but man can't hide things from God. And as you see there in the verses, he said that a, a jar, however, cannot deny the potter made it or say that the potter is ignorant. Actually, the people knew nothing of what was going on, but God always knew everything. And I just want to share with this uh, Psalms 139 so you won't think that I'm I'm making it up. You know, uh, David David was a, a worshiper, you know, and uh, so we we go to his we go to his his uh, in Psalms 139. What what David said was, "O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me." Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Thou understand my thought afar off. Thou compass my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. He didn't just say some of my ways, all of my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. So thou hast beset me behind before laid thine hand upon me. So David, David was saying that, hey, the Lord knows my, he has searched me, he known me, he know my sitting down, my rising up and standing, my thoughts far off. So how did, how did these people thought that they could, they could hide from the omniscient God? So 
back to the lesson, he so he warned that they would soon be met with sorrow for being so high-minded. And the Lord God reminded them that nothing is hidden from him. He is the potter, the one who fashioned and created everything. So my question unto you, because I, I know you, you got, so you're anxious for something to say. What are some instances when worship becomes routine? Because they, their hearts were far away and just, just giving lip service. Things that make you go, hmm. We, we don't have any we don't have any routine worships. Y'all mute it just in case y'all forgot. <laughs> well, I would say maybe some routine prayers. Um, maybe if you continue to say the same prayer over, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, not saying that it's not going to be uh, answered. However, um, we want to talk to God specifically. And um, for example, like <laughs> with my baby, I always say, you know, God's great, God's good. And we thank you for our food by his hands, we all fit. You know, get to a point that is so routine for her. She just, da -da 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 -da. and even as adults, sometimes that can happen with us if we continue to um, just have routine prayers. Okay. Routine is it's, it's become, you know, secondhanded that you said the same things over. Any, anyone else? Some some forms of routine worship, following traditions and rituals from year to year, generation to generation. Um, yeah, those. There you go. It's uh, following you know the tradition. It's not that. You know, traditions and routines are bad. It's bad when it comes against the word of God. That's when it's because there, there are rituals it's just in the Bible, but those were to to keep and maintain the word of God that they would do. You know, the, the Sabbath, all of those, those things were to maintain uh, God's law. So there's not, I just want to put that disclaimer out, but yes, uh, Sister Lawrence, you're right, or, you know, doing those rituals, those things that interfere with the with the word of God. Um, in his ways. Any, anyone else before we, we moving on? I wonder if also I was thinking about, and sometime even, you know, when we come into the assemblies now, of course, it's been over a year, but even, you know, when we come into the assembly, if we just come in and people saying, come on, let's just worship, and we just start, yeah, yeah, clapping our head. Thank you, Jesus. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, it can get routine. Somebody is pumping you. Come on and say it. So you say it, you know, kinds of things. It can get routine that way when you're not feeling it because God knows if it's not in your heart, you're just doing it because somebody is telling you to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's lip service. You know, God is not interested in that lip service. He wants that sincere customer service um, that from your heart. And that's exactly, you know, my, my thoughts as well, Missionary Bridge for you know, the, the, the pumping and the priming, because again, it's, it's come from the inside. It's based off your relationship. You've heard many times within the, the congregation, no one should have to pump and prime you, but you should have a relationship. When you think of the goodness of God and all that he's done, you know, you, you should rejoice. You should automatically want to worship for who he is to you, you know, and then you praise him for what he has done and what he's continued to do. But yeah, that worship is based upon that relationship. No one should have to uh, pump and prime you to worship your God. Worship your God. So I thank you all for those, those answers. So moving right along into the um, next set of verse. This is return to the center. The Lord shifts the message to bring forth hope for what is to come. God delivers the message through Isaiah that he would turn from judgment to restoration of Judah. God did a review of his covenant and promised that if the people repented, they would be restored. They would see fruitfulness in the land. Lebanon, was, uh, which was then occupied by the Assyrian troops, will eventually be productive, fertile again. The deaf would hear and understand what the Lord says. The blind would see and have ability to read. Those, who, those that would humble themselves for him would be filled with joy and poor would rejoice 
and the Holy One of Israel, which is God Almighty himself. In contrast, those who were oppressive, corrupt, evil, and deceivers will be killed and banished from the land. The people will be brought back to their place of dependence and trust in the Lord God because their idols will be destroyed. So this is it's interesting. We know that Jesus came to do the upside down kingdom. Uh, he didn't go out the way that they thought that he would uh, save them from. But here, here um, he's warning them that the people that they look down on, you know, the poor, the deaf, those, um, the, the blind, all, all of the people that they look down on, those people will be lifted, lifted up. You know, there's be drink, be joy. There'd be drink. There'd be joy. Um, it, and, you know, we know the Beatitudes in the Gospel of Matthew 5, when they say the meek shall inherit the, the earth. Those that are humble shall in, inherit. Um, and then the, the, the opposite will be flipped. You know, those that was oppressed, those corrupt, evil deceivers will be killed and banished from the land. So God gave, he came and gave them hope after they had done so, so much wrong, he's restoring. And he always wants to restore a relationship between man and that man is human between man and, and himself. But he did that, you know, he sent his, his son to restore that relationship because man couldn't do it himself didn't have the power so we thank god that he did send his beloved son and that his beloved son gave up the ghost so that we can have that power as if he went on back to his father uh so my question is how does god promise of redemption give us hope today believers When we step out of his will or when we know we do what know what's wrong, he is always there to forgive us and to accept us back into the fold. That's Thank our hope. You, Thank you, Lord. He's there to forgive us and accept us back into the fold. Amen. Anyone else? All right, that's that's that settles it right there. All right, so wrapping up our, our last set of verses. That was the question, Sister Lawrence. Just, just answer, set this back into the fold. That's how we we have we have hope. The prom the God's promise of redemption give us hope today, because we we know that um, also know that by by God um, sending His beloved Son. And Jesus dying on the cross and rising again, he said that I'm going to prepare a place in my father house. There's many mansions. You know, the, we have hope no matter what we're going through. We say, hey, once we transition here, I may not have it all here. But my father's house, there are many mansions. I'm going to my mansions. You know, that song said we're going up to glory. And so so we, we, we here, we, we all want to step into that the promised land of the glory. So to be sanctified um, and then go up, go up to glory. So it's, all, it's give us hope in that as well. The last set of verses a return to the covenant. We know that the, the covenant was first thought off with Abraham, the father of faith, then Isaac, and then passed down to Jacob. So those those are the three promises passed from Abraham to Isaac to uh, Isaac to Jacob. And so these returning into the covenant, it says in these next set of verses that. God reinforces his message to the children of Israel by reminding them of their forefather, Abraham. He said there in the second, the 22nd verse, that is why the Lord who redeemed Abraham says to the people of Israel, my people will no longer be ashamed. My people. See, that's what go, go again, that relationship. That relationship, my people, will no longer be ashamed or turn, turn pale with fear. For when they see their main, many children, many children that he promised Abraham of, and all the blessings I have given them, they will recognize the holiness of the Holy One of Jacob. They will stand in awe of the God of Israel. I mean, these, these just going down um, from these, these set of verses, those, those are more so of, of promises. He's giving you hope. He's 
just giving hope. They will, they will see these things. And then they will, they will, will gain understanding and complainers will accept instruction. So the attitude of the people of Jerusalem and Judah will completely change. Although he chastises, this is what Missionary Bridgeforth was speaking of earlier. Although he chastises the people for their waywardness, he assures them they will no longer live in shame and spiritual poverty. God will continue to fulfill his promise to Abraham that he will be the father of many nations and that his seed will be great in the land, as we read in the uh, book of Genesis. If God chosen people will return to a position of worship and awe of God, then the spiritual plug will be removed to comprehend and follow God's command. God's people need only remember to look for how God has remained faithful to his promises he made to Abraham and all those hundreds of years ago. With those blessings of wealth and progeny fulfilled, even those who scoffed at God and ignore his instruction would change their ways. And we all are products of that, that, of that um, promise with Abraham. We all heirs unto that promise of Abraham and that, that's all that assemble here virtually from the promise that he made with Abraham. So we, we thank him for that. And the last question that you know we have here, what does it mean for us that God will remind Judah of his promise to Abraham and reaffirm that nation's positions as Jacob's descendants. What does it mean to you? Uh, Cause I, I just st stated it for me. Cause we know coming out of the Jacob line, you know, you had David, you have Jesus that's, that's came from so what does these promises mean for us that God would remind Judah of his promise to Abraham and reaffirm the nation's position as Jacob's descendants? Well, I think for me, it just gives us hope. It gives me hope uh, being reminded that God, God's going to restore and he reaffirms his covenant. And, and so that gives me hope. That he yet we can look forward to that day of redemption. Amen. Amen. We can look forward to that day of redemption. Um, and just get this give us hope. Like I said, we we're the heirs to these promises. We all we all the results of these these promises that are, are promises that he made with uh, Abraham hundreds of years ago. You know, we live in the world where we talked about the ancestors, the, the prayers of the ancestors. Well, in the Bible, they talk about the prayer of the ancestors. So that's not anything new. And we are hearers because of those, those what our ancestor has, has done and the promises that he made with them. You know, all throughout the Old Testament, they, God, he was known as the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So the God to their ancestors, so we just have that hope, knowing that the God is not lack concerning his promises. And he's not slow concerning his promises either. So we don't want to get that because he, we're slow concerning our promises, our covenant with him. So that hinders the process of receiving that blessing um, in the, within that. Because we know that he, they walked around the wilderness and they was right there by the promised land. <laughs> They're just doing circles around and around because of their disobedience. So God is not slow concerning his, his promises. We, we are. But I think, thank you for participating in that. And so in conclusion, you know, one of our, our lesson aim is to uh, rejoice for the, the, um, the love that, that's displayed. Rejoice in the manifestation of God's love in our own lives. So in, in conclusion, though, we take, we take the message and to gather from that, that you know, we want to, we want to walk in that love that, that God's have. And we want to work in some type of way that, you know, since we serve a God that's always inviting us back to commune with him, that's has uh, forgiven us and restoring the relationship with them. You know, we want to find some, some of those things that we, where we can restore humanity within our communities. The attitude of the people of Jerusalem and Judah will completely change, oh, excuse me. Uh, God's kindness is intended to lead to repentance. 
However, he will allow circumstances and experiences to chastise and bring us to a place of surrender. After chastisement, God's loving restores. But what would happen if our current justice system followed God's model? You know, the intent of the criminal justice system should not only be to punish for offenses, but to be effective, it should also be restorative. Uh, many times we've heard, uh, you know, in, in the case with Michael Vick, he's a dog murderer. Michael Vick served his time. You know, if, if you're going to continue to up, uphold him for um, murdering dogs, fighting dogs, change the justice system if you don't feel that it's, you know, he that is not justified now. He served his time. He worked there by law. So what 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 we have to do to because it a lot of people that's come out that done done the time based upon it they they have they don't they lose hope because the the society is against them. So what can we do to restore those relationships? Because God lovely restores. <clears throat> a finish should have access to programs within the system that rehabilitates, bring mental, emotional, and spiritual healing that gets to the root causes of the de defiant behavior for true transformation. Essential to restoration and cultivating honorable citizens is access to education that teaches life skills and provides opportunities to be productive members of society rather than breeding criminalization. And as you know, I always leave you with a, a closing devotion to apply the word and the teaching here. So as you go throughout your week, I challenge everyone to consider God's redemptive work through Jesus Christ. And so how could you display God's love in your life within your community? Look for ways your small group or church can support a charity working toward criminal justice reform. And as always, show the love of God. Make sure that your hearts are not far from God. You worship him in the spirit and in the truth, and you don't neglect you don't quit the uh, the Holy Spirit when when doing so. At this moment, that is the end of the lesson. I turn you over to our superintendent, Sister Lawrence, and she give for remarks and ask anyone else. Okay, very good lesson. Enjoyed it. Um, uh, First Lady, would you like to have comments? First lady. Very, 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 yes, and, um, a very good lesson. Very, very good. I enjoyed everything that was said and done this morning. And uh, what scripture came to me was, uh, we must wish of God in spirit and in truth. And whatever we do, he sees the heart. He sees your heart. Mm -hmm. God bless Amen. you. Amen. District missionary, you have any comments? Guess not. Co-pastor, you have any comments? Awesome lesson. No, this is this is great. Happy Mother's Day to everyone. Um, but awesome lesson. Amen. Yes, yeah, very awesome lesson. Um, it lets us know, even with that 13th verse, that mouth says a lot, but if it's not in the heart, God does not honor it. Um, distracted and superficial worship that is merely of habit and obligation means nothing to God. It has to be from a true heart. He wants us, wants our true and genuine worship that is in spirit and truth. As First Lady said, empty rituals and traditions are useless. Every believer must understand that even though we may experience some hardships, God still offers us hope for the future. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Everything about God is good. It is up to us to accept it. If we don't accept it, we can't have it. And we can accept it by worshiping him in a, with a true, true heart in spirit and in truth. We must take him at his word and honor him regardless as to what we may go through. And just less, the lesson, offering hope for the future. God is our hope. He's our help. 
He's our everything. And we bless him and praise him for that. Any other comments or questions? Just real quick, Sister Lawrence, I was just thinking um, when you all were making the comments and as Minister Wright was finishing up, I'm just so thankful that God, we see all that Israel and all that we have done in our disobedience to God. But I thank God that he, he's never done with us. You know how sometimes we're like, uh, you know, I'm just really, I'm done with you. I put up with this so much and all of that. But I thank God he gives us hope. He doesn't say I'm done with you. He after we he put us through all of that and he, he chastised us, but yet he's ready to restore us. So I thank God for the lesson and all the wonderful comments. I thank God that we do have hope. Amen. 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 Anyone else? If not, I'm going to give it back to Minister White. Right. All right. Let us go to the throne of grace with our hearts and mind clear. <clears throat> Most gracious and eternal God, loving God, a God that is forgiving, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to assemble here. We thank you for yet another successful virtual Sunday school, Lord. We thank you for each one that has assembled here virtually, Lord. We ask, Lord, that he that has an ear and she that has an ear, let us hear and apply your word to our lives, Lord. Lord, if we have said anything, Lord, that not, does not glorify you, or Lord, glorify flesh, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you forgive us, Lord. If we have said anything, Lord, that offend our brother or our sister, Lord, that we find our brothers and sisters find in their heart to forgive us, Lord, as we find in our hearts to forgive them as you have forgiven us, Lord. Lord, we ask, we thank you, Lord, for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross and rise up, Lord, and to give us the power over sins, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for you restoring the relationship with us, Lord, and not being like man, Lord, who who, who rejects us, Lord, but Lord, you're allowing us the opportunity to turn away, repent, turn away from our wicked ways, Lord, that you hear and deliver us, Lord. Lord, we, we ask, Lord, as we get ready to dismiss from this service, but never from your present, Lord, that you continue to lead God and protect us, Lord, Lord, that you get the glory, the honor, and the praise is in your son, Jesus' name, the Christ, we do pray and cut all things done by faith. Let I believe say amen. 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 Again, we thank you all for tuning in.